Hey guys, Omaha here. Today I'm going over the Smite Swords Bard, the Barded In, the Win Button, the Win Condition, whatever you want to call this build. Not the most powerful build in the game, certainly one of the most powerful. It took me a while to make this video. It ended up spiraling out of control because I couldn't decide which build I liked better, and it ended up being two builds. So I put both in the same video because everything's relatively the same except for the gear section. The ability points are a little bit different too, but we'll go over that. So when we get to the gear section, you go ahead, skip ahead if you want to just see the second build or continue on if you want to watch the first build. Quick little self promo. I've got a TikTok. I've got a Twitch that I stream on. Lately, I haven't been making YouTube videos or Twitch because of a certain reason. That reason being this right here. And so, yeah, it's been a busy couple weeks. It's been about two weeks, yeah. So, this is the culprit. You can blame her. Anyways, let's get into the content. I hate long intros, so let's do it. So the first build's gonna be a dual wielding crit fishing build, which relies on damage riders as well, and some item interactions to give you just insane burst damage while still providing the support that a paladin and bard can. The second build is going to be a control build where you're gonna be able to control enemies with command, hold monster, hold person with a 100% success rate with the exception of a couple of bosses, which would be like 60 to 80%. So it's really fun to be able to just tell enemies what to do and it happens. If you're wondering what my opinion is on the stronger one, I'd say it's probably the crit fishing build. Hard to say really. I do like both a lot. They're both super fun. And both builds are going to be ideal for being the party face for your team comp or the dark urge for the reason of it being the main character and probably the party face anyway. Okay, here in the character creator, the dark urge, like I said before, is a great option. Not to mention you get that cloak, which is very strong on every build. For race, if you're going the crit build, I would lean towards the half orc because you get the extra dive damage on a crit, which is what you're fishing for. Relentless Endurance is good on both builds, every build in the game. You reach zero hit points, you regain one hit point instead of going down, you get the dark vision for 40 feet. Half orc's good for both builds, more specifically the crit build. Some other options are tiefling, more specifically the zerial tiefling, because you'll get some extra smites, like searing smite, I think. And then the halfling, if you want better consistency. Halfling's really good on every build in the game, I'd say. You get lucky, which when you roll a one on anything, you can re-roll the die and reuse and use the second roll. So the odds of you rolling one twice in a row are like very, very low. And then you get brave, advantage on saving throws against being frightened. For the sub race, I'd say strong heart halfling, because you get advantage on saving throws against poison and resistance to poison damage, as opposed to advantage on stealth checks. You're not really gonna be stealthing as this character. I mean, you can, I guess, if you want, but. We're gonna open up with bard. So too long didn't watch. We're going 10 swords bard, two oath of vengeance paladin. And there's a respec at level seven. We'll start out with six levels in bard. Once you hit level seven, you respec, and you go one paladin, then six bard. So opening with bard, you're gonna get simple weapons, hand crossbows, long swords, rapiers, and short swords as your weapon proficiencies, and light armor is your armor proficiency. So those proficiencies just give you a proficiency bonus to your attack rolls, gonna make it easier to hit, and then the armor proficiency will not impose disadvantage on attack rolls or prevent you from casting spells when you're wearing that type of armor. As far as cantrips go, Vicious Mockery is a great one to start out with. Really, a lot of these are pretty good. Don't use True Strike, it sucks. I would probably go Vicious Mockery, Mage Hand, Friends, or Minor Illusion for your opening cantrips. Friends is really good, especially in Honor Mode when you don't get to save scum. I don't know if any of you are into that, but I'm not. So for the spells, we're really gonna be focusing on the Smites for the most part, and some of the control spells later on, like Hold Monster, Hold Person, Demand. but sleep is really good to open up with because you can put people to sleep up to 24 hit points and everyone in the beginning doesn't have 24 hit points most people don't long strider is really good because it is a ritual spell and it lasts until a long rest so it's not going to use a spell slot when you cast it outside of combat and tasha's hideous laughter is also really good to open up with dissonant whisper is also a good one so just choose whatever you like the most i would say almost certainly put long strider in to support your team and sleep is a good control spell to start out with instrument that's up to you. Background, again, that's kind of up to you, but soldier might be a good idea for athletics and intimidation. Okay, for your ability points, this is where it's gonna vary a little bit depending on which way you're gonna go with the builds. I've got it set up where if you're going to use the crit fishing builds, the optimal way to play it is with elixirs of strength throughout the entire run. So I'm gonna give you stat points for that. And then the other set of stat points is for if you're doing the crit fishing build without elixirs, or you wanna do the control build, they're gonna have the same stats. So for using the crit fishing build with elixirs, you want eight strength, cause you're gonna use the elixirs to buff it. You want 16 dexterity, so you can have some initiative and for your armor class, as well as a fallback option, if for some reason you can't get an elixir, pretty easy to get. You should be able to get three from anti-ethyl every long rest or level up. 14 constitution, make us a little bit tanky. Eight intelligence, because we don't really need it. 12 wisdom to help with wisdom saving throws. And then 16 charisma, because that is gonna buff your spells. Now, 
If you're planning on using the hag's hair at all in your playthrough, I highly, highly, highly suggest putting it on this character because they're gonna benefit the most out of all your characters almost certainly. So in that case, you would want to take your wisdom down a little bit and put 17 dexterity, use the hags hair on the dexterity. For the no elixir, this is for the crit fishing build and the control build. You want to go 16 strength, 10 dexterity, 14 constitution, eight intelligence, 10 wisdom, and 16 charisma. And then again, if you're planning on using the hags hair, you want to tank your wisdom down more and add the point in strength, then use the hags hair on the strength. For your skills, I've already got athletics and intimidation from the background that I chose, the soldier. Kind of go whatever. If you're doing party face, you want persuasion almost certainly. Kind of leave it up to you. Deception might be a good one to go as well for party face. All right, at level two, you're gonna get the class feature jack of all trades which adds your half your proficiency bonus rounded down to ability checks you're not proficient in so that helps balance you out and other checks you get song of rest which is basically a third short rest you can choose another spell again choose whatever it's really up to you it's not too big of a deal once we hit level three you're going to choose your subclass and we go college of swords for those flourishes that's going to be the bread and butter of both of the builds so you're going to want to be using these as much as possible you'll then choose a fighting style if you're going the two-handed crit fishing build you'll want to choose two weapon fighting otherwise for the control it doesn't matter right now for your spells if you're going the control build you want hold person enhance ability is also another good one if you're doing the crit build i would grab enhance ability all right at level four you'll choose another cantrip choose another spell probably choose whichever one you didn't choose between hold person and enhance ability and this is also where you're going to get your first feat and it's pretty simple if you're doing the crit fishing build take savage attacker 100% I wouldn't choose anything else if you plan on doing the control build I would either take great weapon master if you're willing to toggle it on and off in certain situations if you don't want to mess with that or manage it take ability improvement and put those points into strength once you get to level seven and we do that respect you'll have the risky ring by then most likely or around that same point and that'll give you advantage on all your attacks so it's going to offset the accuracy loss from the great weapon master and so that way when you respect you can just grab great weapon master the second time but what great weapon master does if you guys don't already know if you land a crit or kill a target with a melee weapon attack you can make another melee weapon attack as a bonus action that turn and attacks with melee weapons you're proficient with are wielding in both hands can deal an additional 10 damage at the cost of minus five attack roll penalty so that's the part you toggle on and off, and that'll be offset by the Risky Ring later on. Once you get to level five, your Bardic Inspiration will recharge on short rest as well as long rest now, which is definitely huge. And your Bardic Inspiration goes up to a 1d8 instead of a 1d6. You can then choose a level three spell. I would highly recommend Glyph of Warding because it's a very powerful control spell. An alternative to that might be Plant Growth, but I don't see a world where it's better than taking Glyph of Warding for this build. Bard level six, you'll then get Counter Charm. You and allies within 30 feet have advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened. You can choose another spell from one through three. And this is also where you're gonna get your extra attack. So you can now make two attacks per action. Okay, level seven, this is where we're gonna do the respec. So just throw your points and whatever, and then go and hit Withers for the respec. Okay, I've gone to Withers and Respect, and we open up with Paladin. So this is going to give you heavy armor proficiency, which is huge. We're going to be using that quite a bit. You get your Lay on Hands, your Divine Sense, and then you'll want to choose the Oath of Vengeance subclass for Inquisitor's Might. What's lets you or an ally's weapon attacks deal additional radiant damage and can daze enemies for one turn. It's also a bonus action. And by the time you get to this level, you'll be in Act 2. So it's even better in Act 2 because they're all weak to radiant damage. And then for your abilities, if you're using the Elixir, Strength Elixirs, go back to what you were doing before which would be eight strength 16 dexterity 14 constitution eight intelligence and 12 wisdom with 16 charisma so with the elixirs it's the same as before if you're not using elixirs for the crit build or for the control build by this time you should have the gloves of dexterity and we go over that in the gear section but what that's going to do is set your dexterity to 18 and that will let you dump your dexterity entirely so there's really no reason to keep dexterity at all without elixirs and you can just throw those points wherever you think they would benefit you the most wisdom or intelligence just remember even numbers are the ones that give you the bonuses if you go odd number that's not going to give you any benefit okay we're still level seven here our first level was in paladin we'll go back into bard again and you'll kind of just choose the same things you chose before you get another skill proficiency by going into bard and then once you get up to level eight you're going to go back into paladin for your second level in paladin that's going to give you all the smites that we've been looking for you'll then get another fighting style and so if you're doing the dual wielding crit build you want defense 
because that's the only one that's even going to benefit you really at this point gives you plus one armor class and if you're going the control build you'll want great weapon fighting so if you roll a one or a two with a two-handed melee weapon the die is going to be re-rolled once now for your spells here i would highly suggest taking command for the control build and for the crit builds you want all the smites you're going to be smiting left and right up and down you want every smite that's available to you so here you have three smites to choose from and then you have two other options bless is amazing compelled duel pretty good one command is still probably going to be good even on the crit build but you're not really going to be using anything but smites so it doesn't really matter if you want a little bit of extra damage you can go divine favor now back at level nine the rest of your levels are going to go back into bard level seven bard you'll then choose a level four spell and again for the crit build it doesn't really matter you're going to be using smites you want to be using these spell slots for smites so choose whatever it doesn't matter and for the control build, you're going to want to be using hold monster, hold person, and command anyways. So it really doesn't matter at this stage either. So I'll just grab freedom of movement because in general, it's a pretty good spell. Once you get to level 10, you can now choose yet another spell. Again, doesn't matter too much. And then we will be choosing our second feat. Now for your choice of feats, if you've done the crit build, you've already chose savage attacker. And your options at this point, I would say either take alert because you're pretty much guaranteed to go first in every turn of combat. And since you're doing so much damage, you're gonna shut down fights very, very, very quickly. You also cannot be surprised, which is amazing. But an alternative to that is taking ability improvement. And if you take ability improvement, if you did not take elixirs, you'll bump your strength up too. If you did take elixirs, you'll want to bump up your dexterity. So for the crit build, take alert, or take ability improvement. Now, if you're doing the control build, you should have Great Weapon Master selected because at the respec, you chose Great Weapon Master because I told you to. And for your second feat, you'll take Savage Attacker. So you'll end up with Great Weapon Master and Savage Attacker with the control build. And both of these builds are gonna be utilizing the Risky Ring. So that's gonna offset the Great Weapon Master. Once we reach level 11, that'll be our ninth level in Bard. You'll choose another spell. And again, for the crit build, it doesn't matter. You're going to be using all your spells pretty much for smites. But for the control build, you want hold monster because you're going to be utilizing that quite a bit with almost always a 100% success rate. And then finally, we have level 12, your 10th level in Bard. Your Bardic Inspiration will go to a 1d10. You can choose two more expertises to add in. Choose whatever suits your fancy. Choose another cantrip, another spell. Yet again, choose whatever you like. In both cases, it's probably not gonna matter too much. And then we get to the goodies, the magical secrets. Now, most of this is gonna come to personal taste. However, I highly suggest taking Counterspell. No matter which build you choose, Counterspell, I, in my opinion, is the best option because you don't really have a good reaction other than just attacking when they run past you. So shutting down high level spells or just spells in general is phenomenal, especially in honor mode. So in my opinion, this is the best spell to take for magical secrets. And for your second spell, if you are playing the control build, and if you want to be a good guy, you need to take spirit guardians for this build for control. Control good guy, take spirit guardians. Everything else, whether you're doing the crit build or bad guy for control, you can choose whatever you want. But some suggestions, hunger of Hadar is super, super, super OP. Haste, is always good and banishing smite this is the only way to get banishing smite in the game is at a uh, bard level 10 magical secrets this is your one chance to grab it and i know there's a lot of diverging if you want to do this do this um, i'm trying to give you guys a lot of options so there is good guy bad guy variations for this build and you know i just want to give you guys options so that way you guys don't have to ask me down in the comments oh what if i don't want to get the armor of ball because i want to be a good guy well i have an alternative for you guys so that's my reasoning behind giving you like 50 different branches for different things if you do want to know the very most powerful optimal build for both builds you're going to be the bad guy if you want to have the most possible damage but not everybody wants to be the bad guy. So that is it for the leveling section of the build. Now we're gonna get into the gear section. I'm gonna go over the crit build first, all three acts. If you guys are doing the control build, you can go ahead and skip. Down below, I've got the chapters or in the description, just skip ahead to that part. Okay, now we're onto our gear section. For the crit build, if you're not using Elixir, just disregard this for a second, but for Elixirs, your Elixir of Hill Giant Strength is gonna be what you're gonna use for acts one and two mostly and so that'll set your strength to 21 until a long rest so you can get three of those from anti-ethyl in the druid grove or in the riverside tea house three per long rest or level up dareth bone cloak of the mic and the colony sells one to two per long rest tally sells one sometimes and oliver tofoco sells one and then for act three is what i would save these for these are the cloud giant strength elixirs that'll increase your strength to 27 and that lasts until a long rest as well and here's where you can find it i am not gonna read all that 
because that's like an essay right there. All right, so here's the act one gear for the crit build. I'm gonna go over each section in a browser too, just to show you where you get them. So the first piece of gear here is the haste helm for your helmet. It's really important to close in on enemies and finish them off as soon as possible. With your high burst damage, this is a huge boon to be able to close in on enemies on the first turn and then be able to swing in the same turn. I would not use anything else besides this. That's found inside the locked chest near the ancient sigil circle waypoint in the Blighted Village, just in the middle of the Blighted Village in that chest. And that's just gonna give you momentum for three turns at the start of combat. Now I put the Grim Skull Helm here, but you're gonna have to be level seven and have heavy armor proficiency because we do the respec at level seven. Most people don't reach level seven in act one. So I don't know why I put it here. I just put it here just in case, but you can't be crit hit, your resistance to fire damage, and you get Hunter's Mark for free once per long rest. It's dropped by Grim in the Adamantine Forge. That's the very end of act one, pretty much, unless you do the crush afterwards. For your chest armor, you're gonna strive to get the Adamantine Scale Mail. This is a medium armor. It's going to reduce all incoming damage by one. When a melee attack hits you, they're sent reeling for two turns. That's gonna make them have a minus one to attack rolls for every turn remaining. They also can't land crit hits on the wearer. You'll get disadvantage on stealth checks. That's also found in the Animantine Forge. You're going to have to find the scale mail mold and one mithril ore to make it, but it's worth it. And I realize this is at the end of Act 1, so the Graceful Cloth is the alternative to that. You can actually bum rush and get this right away. It's on the road on the way to the crash. Well, this will give you a plus 2 to your dexterity. You also get a plus 1 to your dexterity saving throws and increase your jump distance. And then you'll get the ability Cat's Grace, which gives you advantage on dexterity checks, and you take half falling damage. So you'll buy that from Lady Esther and the Rosamorn. Monastery Trail. Other than that though, you can kind of run whatever medium armor you find. There's not really too many good options in Act 1, at least until the end. And so if you're running the Elixirs, this will put your dexterity at 18 or 20 if you decide to go the Hag's Hair route and you put your dexterity to 17 at the beginning. If you didn't decide to use Elixirs, you might be better off not using this because it's only going to bring your dexterity to about 12. You might be better off just running a normal piece of medium armor or something like that until you get the adamantine scale mail. Moving on to our gloves, the gloves of the growling underdog are going to be the go-to gloves. This gives you advantage when you're surrounded by two or more enemies, so it's going to roll two dice, use the higher value. That's going to help you hit a lot more often, and it's going to give you higher chances to get a crit. You also get strength saving throws plus one. So you'll get that in the goblin camp inside Dror Razglin's treasure crates in the Shattered Sanctum. So for the elixir build specifically, you'll want to keep those. If you're not using elixirs, you're going to want to replace those gloves with the gloves of dexterity once you get these. That'll set your dexterity to 18 and increase your attack rolls by one. This can be bought inside the crash from the trader there. So ideally with running elixirs, you'll wanna run the graceful cloth with the growling gloves of growling underdog because the graceful cloth won't work with the gloves of dexterity. And then if you are not using elixirs, you'll wanna grab the gloves of dexterity and just run a regular medium armor until you get to the adamantian scale mail. Hopefully I'm not confusing you guys too much with this elixir, not elixir, control, crit build, swipping back and forth. I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. Normally I wouldn't do two builds in one video, but kind of made sense at the time, but kind of confusing myself here while I'm recording this at least. For your boot slot, there's not a whole lot of options, but the one option you have is amazing. Disintegrating Nightwalkers. These are honestly boots you could just carry through the entire run, and that's certainly a very viable option. That's probably what I would do. So you can't be inwebbed, entangled, or ensnared. You can't slip on grease or ice. You also get Misty Step once per short rest. That's gonna let you teleport. And you'll get those from Nair at the Grim Forge, kind of at, towards the end of Act 1. Before you get these, there's nothing particularly amazing. So just run whatever you think you'd like. Don't really have a suggestion beyond these. For your necklace slot, it's kind of the same thing. There's only one option that I see is the best, Periaptive Wound Closure. So when you go down, you're automatically stabilized at the start of the turn. And then when you're healed, you restore maximum HP. So if it's like a four to seven heal, you'll heal seven every time. You'll get those by Lady Esther at the Rosamorn Monastery Trail. Same place you'll get the Graceful Cloth from. Moving on to the ring slot. For the first one to prioritize, it's the Strange Conduit Ring. So this will give you 1d4 psychic damage when you're concentrating on a spell. And you can do that pretty easily with Enhance Ability like we went over in the leveling or Detect Thoughts. And you'll find this in the Elegant Chest of the Inquisitor's Chamber in the Crush. And this will come in handy even more in Act 2, the Psychic Damage, when we get the Resonance Stone, because we're going to be abusing that. For your other ring to prioritize, it's the Caustic Band. Pretty simple. Your weapon attacks get an extra 2 Acid Damage, sold by Dareth Bone Cloak in the Myconid Colony. And for your alternatives, we have Crusher's Ring. So this increases your movement speed by 3 meters or 10 feet. That's worn by Crusher in the Goblin Camp. You can either uh, kiss his feet and get that, or you can kill him. And then the Ring of Protection is the other alternative. You can get plus 1 Armor Class and plus 1 Saving Throws with that ring. Rewarded by Maul if you steal a sacred idol in the Druid Grove. For your weapons in Act 1, since this is a crit fishing build, Knife of the Undermountain King is king. And this will reduce the number you need to get a crit by one. 
when you roll two damage or less, reroll the dice, taking the highest result. Shadow Blade, you have advantage on attack rolls against lightly or heavily obscured targets when using this blade. Bought or looted from the trader in the crash. Second weapon you should be going for is the Short Sword of First Blood. This is going to give you an additional 1d8 piercing damage to targets that still have full HP. And you can find this on the corpse of the executed Deep Gnome in the Underdark at the entrance of the decrepit village. And the one alternative I have for you guys is the Susser Dagger or any of the Susser weapons really because it'll shut down any spell casters by silencing them on a hit. All right, before we get to the actual gear part of Act 2, I need to mention if you're not using elixirs, you should try to go for the Potion of Everlasting Vigor for this build. It's not going to matter if you're doing the elixir version because your strength will already be buffed using the elixirs, so this won't have any effect. But without the elixirs, if you drink this, it'll permanently increase your strength by two. And to get that, you'll have to convince a Starian to bite Araj Obladra in Moonrise Towers. Another thing you're going to want to go for in Act 2, very important for this build, is the Resonance Stone that gives everyone within 30 feet or 9 meters of you the condition steeped in bliss. Now, that's going to make all those entities have advantage on physical checks and disadvantage on mental saving throws, but they're all going to be vulnerable to psychic damage. That includes yourself, but you'll be all right, trust me. So that is going to give you double damage with psychic to all enemies in melee range of you, and that's the important part. So you'll find this inside the Mind Flayer Colony, in a small area southwest of the Necrotic Laboratory, near the Mind Archive interface. Okay, here is our Act 2 gear that we will be running. We'll start off with the helmet, the Dark Does Just See Your helmet. This gives you a plus one bonus to saving throws against spells. While obscured, the number you need to roll a crit is reduced by one, which can stack with the Knife of Undermountain King. Constitution saving throws are plus one. You'll find that in the Gilded Chest and the Gauntlet of Shar. For your armor, you have the Adamantine Splint Armor, which is from the Grim Forge in Act 1. That's the heavy armor variant. So this will reduce all incoming damage by two. When a melee attack hits you, they're sent reeling for three turns. Level minus one penalty to attack rolls for every turn remaining. So it starts out as minus three, then goes down and down. They can't land crits on you, and then they have disadvantage on stealth checks. The alternative armor to that is the Yonti Scale Mail. Now that's a medium armor, but it adds your full dexterity modifier to your armor class. Additionally, you don't get disadvantage on stealth ability checks. You also get a plus one to initiative rolls. Now the thing with these gear pieces is if you're running the adamantine splint armor, you don't want to be running the grim skill helmet at the same time because they both just make it so you can't be crit hit. So you run the just dark just this year helmet with the adamantine splint. Or if you want to run the Yonti scale mail, your AC will actually be 21 instead of 20. And you could throw on the Grim Skill helmet instead of the Dark Justicier helmet to make it so you don't get crit hit. Or you could still run the Dark Justicier helmet. It's up to you. That's just an option. But you don't want to be running both these, the helmet and this best piece at the same time because it's kind of pointless. For your glove slot, the flawed held us gloves are the ones to go for. Unless you are not using elixirs, I would still stick with the gloves of dexterity. Those are your go-to for most of the run, if not the whole run. You got to keep your dexterity high for the initiative and armor class. But for the elixir build, I would use these. It's going to make your weapon attacks deal an additional 1d4 fire damage. And then there's an unarmed benefit too, but you're not going to be unarmed. And then you get strength saving throws plus one. That's sold by Damon in the last light in. For your cloak, if you're not using the Deathstalker mantle from the Dark Urge, I would go with this. This is going to give you plus one to your armor class and plus one to saving throws. And you can buy that from Quartermaster Tally at the last light in. Then for the ring slot, you're going to want to replace your caustic band with the risky ring. That's going to give you advantage on all attack rolls, but you receive disadvantage on saving throws. That's sold by Araj Oblodra in the main floor of Moonrise Towers. Now make sure you take off the caustic band because we're going to be using the strange con conduit ring because that strange conduit ring the psychic damage is actually going to be two to eight when you're using the resonance stone moving on to weapons you're going to keep your knife of the undermountain king and you're going to replace your other short sword with the render of mind and body that's going to give you the ability psychic steel virtuoso when you attack with advantage you deal an additional 1d8 psychic damage now with the risky ring you're always going to be attacking with advantage and with the resonance stone it's going to double your psychic damage so that'll actually be 2d8 psychic damage so you see where i'm getting with this okay moving on to a ranged option you're not really ranged but the dark fire short bow which you get by from damon and last light in it gives you resistance to fire and cold damage and then you can also use haste for free once per long rest so that in and of itself is really really beneficial to you and finally a little bonus if you want to cheese it a little bit extra you can use the Drake Throat Glaive, and you're not actually going to be using this weapon per se. You're going to be using its ability on the weapons you're going to be actually holding. So you drop your weapons, and you use Draconic Elemental Weapon. And what that does is imbues a weapon with elemental power. It gets a plus one bonus to attack rolls and damage rolls and deals an additional 1d4 damage of your choice. So you can choose between acid, cold, fire, lightning, and thunder. You can only do that on one weapon unless you use a sorcerer and you use twin cast. So you give this weapon to your sorcerer, a twin cast draconic elemental weapon on both your Knife of the Ender Mountain King and your Render of Mind and Body. And both of them will get those bonuses to their attack rolls and the extra damage. Just a little bit extra if you want to cheese it some more. And that is sold by Roa Moonglow on the ground floor of Moonrise Towers. Now before the Act 3 gear, there is the option of doing the Mirror of Law 
costs in Act 3, which will increase an ability permanently by 2, and you can certainly try to do that. The roll is pretty hard, especially in honor mode where you can't save scum or anything like that. But increasing an ability by two is very useful. So again, when you're not using elixirs, you'll increase the strength by two. If you are using elixirs, increase your dexterity again by two. Okay, and here's what our act three gear is gonna look like. Let's get into that. So for your helmet slot, Saravok's Horned Helmet is the way to go. This is going to give you Deathbringer Sight. You get Dark Vision up to 10 feet or 50 feet if you already have Dark Vision. The number you need to roll a crit is reduced by one. So that's for our crit fishing. You get Dauntless. You can't be frightened and cannot be afflicted with other emotion altering conditions. And then you'll loot that from Saravok during Act 3. Alternatively, you can go for the Helmet of Grit. That'll give you an extra bonus action when you're at 50% HP or less. So with the dual wielding, that's an extra attack for you. And then Dexterity saving throws plus one. Looted from a chest in the Cursed Room of Sar Palace. For your armor, the best armor you can possibly put on is the Ballast Armor. I know a lot of people don't want to go the bad route, so there is an alternative to that, but this will give you Aura of Murder. Enemies within six and a half feet or two meters become vulnerable to piercing damage, so they'll take double damage from piercing unless they're resistant or immune to it. You also get Ambusher plus two initiative, which is really good to help you go first. Sold by Echo of Abazigal in the Muter Tribunal after you become an unholy assassin. So again, you got to be a bad guy for that. And that is the best armor. But you can go Armor of Persistence as well if you want to be the good guy. That's a heavy armor. It's going to reduce all incoming damage by two. You'll get Resistance and Blade Ward. So the Resistance is a 1d4 bonus to saving throws, and Blade Ward is half damage from bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing. And that's just a passive feature that's always active. So you can buy it from Damon at the Forge of the Nine in the lower city of Baldur's Gate. Onto Gloves. The Helldust Gloves are the ones to go for. This gives you a plus one bonus to spell attack rolls and spell save DC. Weapon attacks have additional 1d6 fire damage. Again, it has an unarmed part. It doesn't matter. We're not going to be unarmed. Strength saving throws plus one. And then you get Rays of Fire as a cantrip once per short rest. It lets you hurl three Rays of Fire, each dealing 3d6 fire damage. That's dropped by Harlep in the House of Hope. Your main hand weapon will be the Crimson Mischief, legendary short sword. So this gives you quite a bit of things, actually. And the important thing is you want to run this in the main hand. So when you're running this weapon, you'll deal an additional 1d4 piercing damage against targets with 50% of their HP or fewer. And that's going to work as well with your Ballast Armor if you're using that. For the main hand, when you make an attack with advantage, which you will with the Risky Ring, it's like an additional seven piercing damage. So that's why it stacks really well with the Ballast Armor. And that's why I'm saying Ballast Armor is the best way to go. Um, I wouldn't worry about the offhand part. You're not gonna be running this in the offhand if you run the other weapon. This is dropped by Orin. The one you wanna run in the offhand is the Bloodthirst. This will give you improved critical, reduces the number you need to roll a critical hit by one which stacks for a crit fishing. You get true strike as a cantrip once per short rest. Armor class plus one in your offhand, which is what we're going to be using it for. And then in your offhand, when a creature misses you with a melee attack, you may retaliate and gain true strike. Now, the reason we're not running this one in the main hand is because when you run the Crimson Mischief in the offhand, it gives you the bonus of when you attack with your offhand weapon, you add your ability modifier to the damage of the attack. And we already got that bonus when we were leveling up. It was one of the passives we selected, the dual weapon fighting. So it's really just going to give us nothing if you run this in the offhand. So you just get more by running the Crimson Mischief in your main hand and the Bloodthirst in your offhand. Some alternative weapons, you could run the Rhapsody. It's a pretty good weapon. Um, you get a plus one to attack rolls, damage, and spell save DC for every foe you slay up to a maximum of three. And then possibly inflict bleeding when hitting a creature with this weapon while hiding or invisible. It's just not nearly as good as Bloodthirst and Crimson Mischief combined. Or you could even continue to run Knife of the Undermountain King or even Render of Mind and Body because those are still really strong. But moving on to our amulet, we have the Amulet of Greater Health. This is the best one to run, in my opinion. It's going to set your constitution score to 23, and you'll have advantage on constitution saving throws. Stolen from a trap pedestal in the archive of the House of Hope. So what this is going to allow you to do is dump your constitution stat. So constitution set at 23, you can completely tank your constitution. And then if you decide to go the no elixir route, this is where you can make up for the loss of dexterity and bring your dexterity up quite a bit. And so in that case, you wouldn't really need the dex the gloves of dexterity. You could run the hell dust gloves. And if you did go the elixir route and you already have a high dexterity, you can distribute out your points into other things. So you can put it in intelligence or wisdom or even charisma and round out your character a lot more. And finally, for your ranged option, this is definitely gonna help you more than probably anybody else since you're crit fishing, is the dead shot. This is gonna give you the number you need to roll a crit hit, reduced by one, and then your keen attack. The wielder doubles their proficiency bonus when rolling a ranged attacks with this weapon, unless they have disadvantage. You're not gonna really be attacking with range, but this is sold by Fitz the Firecracker at the Storm Shore Armory in the lower city. So with all those crit reductions, I think you'll have like a 20% or maybe a little higher than that chance to crit. So one in every five hits is gonna be a crit, which is, extremely powerful. And then you combine that with Slashing Flourish where you're attacking two enemies at a time, or even the ranged version of that. You can still target the same enemy twice. 
or two different enemies, and then you smite on top of that, that's where all your damage is gonna be coming from. Once you get to act three for your ring slots, you can kind of choose to get rid of the strange conduit ring, or you can keep it, or you could swap it out for something like Killer Sweetheart, or you can go back to the Caustic Band, or you can kind of run whatever ring you really want whatever you think's the best. Okay, now moving on to our act one gear for the control build. This is what it looks like. I have alternate gear over here as well. For your helmet, you're gonna wanna go for the haste helm. You'll find this in the chest near the waypoint in the blighted village. This is pretty straightforward. Everybody knows what this does pretty much. It gives you momentum for three turns at the start of combat. Each turn of momentum gives you five feet movement speed. So that's 15 feet on the first turn. So that'll help you get to your first target as soon as possible. And the goal of this is to end fights as soon as possible. So after that, the Shade Spell Circlet is something you'd want to go for. There is a kind of a weird mechanic with it if you don't want to mess with that stick with the Haste Helm, but while you're obscured in shadow, your spells get a plus one bonus to spell save DC. That makes it more likely to succeed, so that's going to help with your Command Spell and your Hold Person Spell. And that's sold by Omelum in the Mykonid Colony. For chess piece, if you're going the good guy route, you want the Luminous Armor, and this is going to be the armor you're going to wear for the entire run, all the way through Act 3 to the end of the game. So this gives you Radiant Shockwave. When you deal Radiant Damage, it causes a Radiant shockwave now the radiant shockwave is going to inflict radiating orbs in a 10 foot radius on the creature and that's going to cause them to have minus one to attack rolls per remaining turn and that's going to be a two turns to start with so that's minus two and it sheds light in the area surrounding it now that's important for later too because it's a condition act one it's found in the lock and trap opulent chest in the cellulite outpost in the underdark so that's right under the goblin camp right when you go down there it's just right there in a chest and up until that point you just wear basically any medium armor that you can find once you get to level three that's when you get medium armor proficiency if you're going the bad guy route you'll have to wait to get the adamantian scale mail or the adamantian splint armor by that time you might be around level sevens towards the end of act one both of these you'll get in the grim forge the scale mail will reduce all incoming damage by one when you're hit by a melee attack, they're sent reeling for two turns, take a penalty to attack rolls for every turn remaining, and then they can't land crits on you. The splint's about the same, except it reduces the damage by two, and they're reeling for three turns. And the reason you need to be level seven for this is because you need to respec and go into your paladin to have the heavy armor proficiency. Now moving on to gloves, you're gonna wanna go for the gloves of the growling underdog. That'll give you advantage on melee attack rolls when you're surrounded by two or more enemies, and strength saving throws plus one, so that's gonna help offset your great weapon mastery, because you get that minus five to your accuracy with that. So that's found inside drawer Rasglin's treasured crates in the Shattered Sanctum. After that, the gloves of dexterity are what you're going to go for, and those are going to be the gloves you run for the entire game. And you get plus one in your attack rolls. You can buy that from the trader in the crash. You want the Fowler Aluve. Aluve. I don't know how to say it. I'm definitely saying it wrong. Plus one to performance, which I mean doesn't matter. I guess you are technically a bard, so it could. It'll give you Fowler Aluve Melody. The sword hums in anticipation, ready to sing or shriek. Effect ends when it is unequipped. So you're only going to want to be using the sing really with this, and it's basically like a bless. So all allies within 20 feet are going to have a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws and that lasts until it's unequipped and it recharges on a short rest okay actually that lasts for five turns i was wrong but still and that sing's also going to help with your great weapon master feat you can find it in the underdark it's stuck in a rock now the weapon you're going to want to replace that with in act one as well is the unseen menace now this is going to give you advantage on all attack rolls it loses the property for two rounds on a missed attack roll. The weapon also scores a critical hit when rolling a 19. And that's sold in the crash as well by the trader. Moving on to boots, the boots of Stormy Clamor are the best if you're the good guy, because when the wearer inflicts a condition upon a hostile creature, they also inflict two turns of reverberation. And like I said, with the luminous armor, those radiant orbs are considered a condition. So once you get the radiant orbs on them, just by hitting them, they're gonna get two turns of reverberation. Now reverberation is gonna give them a minus one penalty to strength, dexterity, and constitution saving throws per remaining turn. When they have five or more turns of reverberation it takes 1d4 thunder damage and must succeed a dc 10 constitution saving throw or fall prone creatures immune to thunder damage can't receive it so your radiating orbs just get better these are sold by omelum in the ebon lake grotto after completing help omelum investigate the parasite for the bad guys you're going to want to go disintegrating night walkers and you'll run these till the end of the game makes it so you can't be in webbed entangled or ensnared and you can't slip on grease or ice and you get misty step once per short rest which lets you teleport those are worn by nair so you'll get those from killing him at the end of act one you've basically got most of your gear in act one whether you're good or bad good guys you've got your luminous armor for the rest of the game your gloves of dexterity for the rest of the game and your boots of stormy clamor for the rest of the game those are all things you're going to run for the entire game and if you're a bad guy you've got your gloves of dexterity and your disintegrating night walkers now for your rings you have the caustic band this will give you two acid damage on melee weapon attacks or on weapon attacks in general sold by dareth bone cloak in the mykonid colony so that's a good ring on like most builds in the game it's just a good ring in general and then crusher's ring also a good ring in general increases your movement speed by 10 feet or three meters and that's worn by crusher at the goblin camp you can get it if you uh do the kissing feet thing whatever if you're into that 
or you can kill Crusher. For your Act 1 cloak, there's not really anything to run besides the Deathstalker mantle, which is from the Dark Urge route, and I highly suggest doing that, either good or bad. I think it's the best way to play the game. But you get the cloak, and it lets you turn invisible every single turn when you kill an enemy, and then you'll inv be invisible for two turns, so you're pretty much always invisible. You're constantly killing enemies. It's overpowered. All right, before we get into the Act 2 gear, it's important you want to go and get this. It permanently increases your strength by two, which is huge. That's going to help you a ton. All right, now our Act 2 gear. This is what it kind of looks like. We've got all the uh, options over here as well. Your first piece is your helmet, Helmet of Arcane Acuity. So this is something you'll run for the rest of the game. And whenever you deal damage with this, with a weapon attack, you get Arcane Acuity for two turns and you get Dexterity saving throws plus one. So Arcane Acuity will give you a plus one bonus to spell attack rolls and spell save DC for each remaining turn. You reduce the duration by two each time the entity takes damage, it has a maximum duration of 10 turns, and you can keep stacking that up and up and up and it'll make your control spells land like 100% of the time. So it's a very crucial piece of gear. It's locked and trapped in the gilded chest in the secret area of the Wraithwind Mason's Guild basement. Now, if you're a bad guy, you're gonna wanna go with the Dwarven Splint Mail, or you can keep your Adamantine gear, either the Splint or the Scale Mail. This is another option though. It might be better actually. So it'll give you one less piercing damage, gain a plus one bonus to strength and saving throws and ability checks, and then you get plus two to your constitution. So it makes you a little bit tankier. And this is sold by Lantarv in the main floor of Moonrise Towers. If you convince Disciples Rel to give you additional aid in finding Ketherick's Relic. And then for our ring, you'll want to ditch Crusher's Ring and go for the Risky Ring. That's going to give you advantage on all attack rolls, but you'll receive disadvantage on saving throws. And this is sold by Raj Obrod Oblodra in the main floor of Moonrise Towers. Once you get this, you won't really need the Unseen Menace anymore because that gave you advantage. Now you have advantage all the time with this ring. And so you can run a different weapon, which brings us to the Halberd of Vigilance. This is probably the best two-handed weapon for you in Act 2. It's very rare. It adds force damage, and it's a plus two weapon. You'll get plus one to initiative rolls, which is huge an advantage on perception ability checks whatever when you make an attack roll as a reaction you make it with advantage lantarv on the ground floor of moonrise towers is where you can buy it if you're willing to be a bad guy and i highly suggest it for this build because it's so busted i don't even know how it's a thing you want the shara spear of evening and if you know the quest line you know what you got to do but this gives you advantage on saving throws while lightly and heavily obscured. This weapon deals an additional 1d6 damage to creatures that are lightly or heavily obscured. That's important. Immune to blinded. You get Shars Darkness, which is a darkness spell. It creates a darkness cloud that blinds creatures within. Let's actually just go to that really quick. It heavily obscures and blinds them within. It can't make ranged attacks in or out. So since you're immune to blind, it doesn't affect you. And you deal extra damage to heavily obscured creatures, so that helps. And so back to this. The advantage doesn't really matter because you got the risky ring, but the additional damage does help. And you can't be blinded, so you can use it to your advantage to go inside there and just murk everybody without them being able to do much to you. Speaking of which, the blinded condition is going to give them disadvantage on all their attack rolls. It, it makes it impossible for them to hit you, pretty much. Even more importantly, you get the ability Edge of Darkness. It seems kind of what Whatever, on the surface it creates a cloud of darkness while you attack but this is considered a melee attack and it uses an attack roll and it also creates a cloud of darkness so you get all the benefits of the previous darkness that i just read but let me just show you this in game because it makes it'll make more sense consider an attack roll it recharges on a short rest and it's a weapon attack now there's multiple bags here maybe i can just show you in the bags so there it hit three or four different times. I got Arcane Acuity, six stacks of Arcane Acuity because it's considered a weapon attack. So I got Arcane Acuity from that, almost completely maxed out, which will let me do my command spells perfectly. So if there's multiple enemies there, you're just gonna hit multiple enemies, get your Arcane Acuity up to the roof. And then you have the benefit of, since it's an AOE and it's all separate attack rolls, you're actually able to smite every single enemy that you hit with that ability. So basically you can divine smite like five enemies at a time with this ability. So you'll pull up your reactions page and you'll toggle on all your smites and by the way you're going to do this with your slashing flourishes as well you're going to be able to it's going to pop up like five different times asking if you want to smite every single enemy that you hit with that so that is insane insane damage that you're going to get from this and this is the weapon you're going to want to run for the rest of the game if you're a bad guy and bad guy is certainly more op than the good guy build but hey Sometimes you want to be the good guy, you know, save the day. Finally, for your cloak is the cloak of protection, or you can keep running the Deathstalker mantle for the Dark Urge. So this cloak gives you plus one armor class, plus one saving throws, and you can get that from Quartermaster Tally in the last side in. I also forgot to mention, if this is available, you'll want to use this as your ranged weapon. You're not going to specifically use the ranged version of it or the ranged attacks with it. You just want the buffs it gives you. So resistance to fire and cold damage, and then you get haste for free once per long rest. That'll almost certainly be taken by somebody else, but if it's not, 
grab that for this build. Act three gear, this is what it's gonna look like right here. These are the gears you're gonna run, and this is like evil stuff. There's some good guy stuff over here still. But before we get into that, another disclaimer for you, sorry. Mirror of Loss, you'll want to hit this if possible. It's in the House of Grief, and increase your strength yet again by two permanently. That'll just make you absolutely cracked, even though you kind of already are. Cloak of the Weave is gonna be your cloak that you wanna replace, or you wanna replace your old cloak with. This will give you Arcane Enchantment, so plus one bonus to spell save DC and spell attack rolls, and then absorb elements, which is whatever, I mean, it's good, but but absorb elemental damage once per short rest, take half damage from the next elemental attack targeting you, and deal an additional 1d6 of that element type on your next attack. Sold by Hellsick at the Devil's Fee once her special stock is unlocked. For the bad guys, you want the Ballist Armor, so this gives you Aura of Murder. Enemies within 2 meters or 6.5 feet become vulnerable to piercing damage unless they're resistant or immune to it. And then you get Ambusher, which is a plus 2 bonus to your initiative rolls. That's sold by Echo of Abazigal in the Muter Tribunal after the player character accepts the ball and becomes an Unholy Assassin. So yeah, that's OP. That's going to make you deal double damage with piercing and you're using the Shar Spear of Evening, which is piercing damage. So think about it, it's OP. Now for your amulet, Amulet of Devout's the way to go. It's the best one to run. And that'll give you a plus two bonus to your spell save DC. Again, you're gonna have like a 100% chance to land your command spell and your hold monster, hold person. And then God's Will, you gain an additional use of channel divinity charge. Once you use it, it was restored upon taking a long rest. That doesn't help you at all, but hey, it's there. That's looted from the main offering chest in the basement of Stormshore Tabernacle. Now there is an alternative to that. It's the Amulet of Greater Health. That was in the other build as well. It's super OP because it sets your constitution to 23 and that'll let you tank your constitution and increase your other stats. So it's certainly a viable option and that's stolen from the trapped pedestal in the archive of the House of Hope. Now for your ring, you're gonna wanna replace your other ring and keep the risky ring but you're gonna replace it with this, the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel. So after you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can cast illusion or enchantment spells. Eh, eh as a bonus action. Looted from a backpack in the jungle in Act 3. There's the coordinates right there. But um, yeah, that's gonna let you use like your, uh, any of your enchantment spells, your um, command, which is important, and your hold person, and your hold monster. Those are like your three go-to spells for this build. So you can now cast that as a bonus action, which is OP. And then if you're a good guy, now if you're a good guy, your alternatives to running the Shar Spear from Act 2, once you get to Act 3, Nyrona is probably your best bet up until you can get to the Baldurin's Giant Slayer. Now, Rona is pretty good. It gives you thunder damage on all your hits um, and it returns to your hand when thrown. You cannot be forced to drop it. When thrown, it creates an explosion, does 3d4 thunder damage in a 20-foot blast centered on the target. You get a 10-foot bonus to movement speed and jump distance. When you equip it, you get immunity to fall damage. Kind of cool. And then it has light around it for 20 feet. Also has two abilities, Zephyr Flash and Zephyr Break. So those are cool. Um, you'll get that from winning the jackpot from Akabi in the Circus of the Last Days in Rivington. And if you're a bard, it's also a possible to win the jackpot by passing a dc 15 performance check there you go oh it's found in a dc 20 locked painted chest in the jungle there you go that's uh your best bet until you get to this baddie and this thing's very overpowered it's certainly not as strong as using the star spear of evening on a hit double the damage from your strength modifier so that's a lot more damage there it grants you advantage on attack rolls against large huge or gargantuan creatures but you already have advantage so that's whatever you get giant form Grow to a fearsome size, you'll deal an additional 1d6 damage, and you get 27 temporary hit points. And then you get advantage on strength checks and saving throws. And that'll recharge once per short rest, so that's nice for a little extra damage and tankiness. But then, you get Cleave, you get Palmer Strike and Last Rate, and then Cleave, which lets you attack up to three enemies at once, so you can do smites on those three. And then you get the special weapon action, Topple the Big Folk. Deal additional damage equal to your proficiency bonus on a hit to large, huge, or gargantuan creatures. Take an additional 2d6 slashing damage, and they have to succeed a strength saving throw or fall prone. That's looted from the answer in the dragon sanctum in the worm way so that's super late in act three but hey that's the best the best is usually towards the end and then finally for your ranged option for both good and bad this is the way to go the hell rider longbow so this will give you plus three to initiative rolls which is massive for this build advantage on perception checks once per turn creature hit by this weapon will possibly be inflicted with fairy fire you're basically in it for the initiative it's sold by ferg droger in rivington and this is certainly not going to be contested by other people in your party most likely so it's a good one to run when it comes to the illithid powers there's a lot of ways you can go and there's certainly a lot of good ones but i'll just name some of the standouts so favorable beginnings is good on pretty much every single build in the game. It's one of the best powers in the game. First attack roll or ability check you make against any target gets a bonus equal to your proficiency bonus. That's gonna give you just increased accuracy every time you attack somebody new for the first time. Look at the Far Realms. Once per long rest, you can change a successful hit into a crit. So that's amazing on pretty much everyone as well. If you are not in honor mode, you can abuse perilous stakes for double damage on 
any target. And more specifically, on the crit build, since you're already abusing psychic damage and they're vulnerable to it, psionic overload and stage fright both are going to be so good because it's just going to double all that damage. Fly is probably the best thing for you or one of the best. Just the movement, being able to get around targets is amazing and you definitely would want to get that. And if I have to mention block hold, you guys, you guys haven't even played the game. Obviously, it's overpowered. And then I guess if you want to abuse psychic damage even further, you could even go like into Call of the Weak, Mind Blast. You could use Concentrated Blast with your concentrating spells that you're using on your crit build. There's a lot of options. So that's about it. And that's gonna do it for the Smite Swords Bard or Bard and then Build. Check me out on Twitch, my shorts channel. Check that out. It's more of an experimental thing. I'm just gonna see how it does. Yeah. Here's a puppy again. Subscribe for the puppy. All right, catch you guys in the next one. Peace out. Don't forget to subscribe.